Okay, so like Tudor, I also made some last minute changes uh, to the subject of my talk. Um, I I'm still gonna talk about two categorical things, but I don't think I'm gonna mention category O uh, in any sort of way. I think it would just be way too much. So I just wanna start uh, with Tudor's talk. Uh, so a reminder that he defined or said that an oriented three, two, one, zero TQFT, or people sometimes call this fully extended, uh, is uh, the same thing as a symmetric monoidal functor. Or maybe he implicitly said this. I don't know that he actually. Oh, oriented. I don't know why I said oriented twice. Uh, well, which Tudor called Z, and I will continue. Um, from a certain two category of three dimensional cobordisms. And because uh, they're oriented, I'm going to ask these things to be equipped with an orientation to the two category, or sorry, to the three category of two linear categories. Um, so in particular, uh, if M N is a closed uh, N less than or equal to three dimensional manifold, Uh, you expect to get an object, and uh, you expect it to be in 2n minus 1 cat z linear. And so this is a little bit uh, maybe uh, confusing. So let me write down what exactly this means. So, uh, so if you put in 3, you get minus 1. So minus one cat C linear, just the complex numbers. Zero cat C linear uh, is equal to the category of C linear vector spaces. One cat C linear, well, is just C linear categories. Uh, so categories, all of whose Hom spaces are vector spaces. And then finally, uh, two cat uh, is the categories enriched um, in C linear categories. So if you, once you have this definition, you can basically start iterating. So three cat would be categories enriched in two cat and so on and so on and so on. And then there's kind of an interesting fact where uh, each one is the monoidal unit in the one before. So like C is the monoidal unit in VECT, VECT is the monoidal unit in cat C, cat C is the monoidal unit inside of two cat. Um, okay, so there's like some sort of like interesting uh, recursive structure here. And this, uh, we've been talking about this all week. So we did not talk about how to get numbers out of three manifolds, but we've talked a lot about the vector spaces associated to two manifolds. Tudor talked a little bit about a braided, certain braided tensor category that was associated to a one manifold. Uh, and I'm gonna try and go all the way down to zero manifolds. Um, but let me just say a little bit more structure of like what you have. So since you have uh, a functor, uh, this thing has the property that if you have some oriented cobordism, so that's a morphism uh, in this three category of cobordisms where you have some oriented manifold with boundary of dimension less than or equal to three, and then it has uh, an incoming boundary and an outcoming boundary, uh, which you can tell by comparing the boundary orientations to the orientation of M. Uh, then this thing is supposed to give you a functor from whatever your category associates to the incoming boundary and spits out whatever it associates to the outcoming boundary. Um, okay, and then there's a lot of variations on this idea. 
Uh, like one could equip the cabordisms with like geometric structure, like orientations, spin structures, spin C structures, framing. Uh, another variant of this idea is you could take like a partial category of three manifold, three, sorry, a partial three category of three cabordisms where you say don't allow uh, like all uh, compact three manifolds to be in your category. This often happens if these numbers are infinity. Uh, like basically you can fix it in that way. Um, you know, there are variants where people like only allow cabordisms built with certain kinds of, or built with certain kinds of handle attachments. Uh, but basically field theories are like something roughly of this form. Um, and there's a uh, conjecture uh, due to Baez and Dolan and then proved by Lurie. And I think that now there's several, uh, there's another partial proof by uh, Ayala and Francis um, and company, uh, which says that um, Z is completely determined by what it assigns to a point plus some extra structure on this two category. So I don't need to know like any of the other vector spaces, but I might need uh, additional, additional data. Um, one example of um, like the kind of data that you might need is like in the two categorical set, setting, like sometimes like you need um, some sort of uh, like pairing, uh, like on your category, to, like what tensored with itself to vect, or sometimes you might need something like a serifunctor, a trivialization of some serifunctor or something of that nature, but that's not gonna be important for us. Uh, but let me just go ahead and tell you like some examples of like how you can recover some things. So just because I'm gonna have to keep writing it over and over and over again, let me just call this thing C. Um, so for example, uh, like you, through this reconstruction theorem, uh, you can see things like, if you look at the, uh, the zero dimensional cabordism as zero, so this is the zero sphere, the boundary of the one disc, uh, like this thing will actually, you can prove that it's isomorphic to the endomorphisms of C. Um, and so this thing will be uh, a two cat. Uh, this, if you wanted to know what your um, field theory assigned uh, to like this particular cabordism, uh, it would be uh, the identity in C. Uh, and then uh, similarly, uh, you know, you could ask, uh, if you look at this cabordism, uh, okay, so this thing has two copies uh, of, of, S, of S0. So uh, since this thing is a tensor functor, uh, it, the source for this morphism is gonna be uh, NC tensor NC. And then the, the last thing is like another copy of S0. So it goes to NC and this thing represents uh, just the composition law, which is like obvious that there's like a composition like on this guy. Uh, so you can go further. Um, and so let me actually give a different notation for this. Uh, so I'll call this thing uh, ZE1. C, so the E1 center of C, I'll explain exactly what that means once I tell you what a couple of other things are. Uh, so now uh, you can look at uh, what your field theory assigns to a circle. Um, and just by general cabordism games, you can see that you can build a circle by taking two uh, intervals and gluing them together. 
Uh, it turns out that if I had drawn the, the interval in the other direction, it would have been uh, represented by the functor hom into uh, the identity. And if you work out uh, what that means, you can see that this guy can actually be recovered from uh, your two category as the endomorphisms of the identity functor inside of the category you assign to the zero sphere. Um, and so this thing, uh, I'll call uh, the E2 center. Let's see. Uh, so this thing has uh, a natural, so it has a unit, uh, the, as Tudor said, uh, given by this guy. And uh, similarly, it has uh, a composition uh, given by uh, uh, the pair of pants. Um, so then gives like a multiplication. Uh, but you notice that you can rotate these circles around each other. Uh, so this thing, uh, this uh, um, composition is uh, sort of commutative, but like if you're like very careful, you can see that actually this thing will be uh, braided. So it'll be a braided tensor structure. Uh, and topologists call this thing uh, an E2 algebra structure. Um, and the E2 uh, is coming from the fact that it's related to uh, the configuration space of points in R2. Uh, this one was related to the configuration space of points in, in R1. And this, this product is like not commutative whatsoever. Um, and so finally, like you can play this game again uh, and you can get some vector space, uh, which will be uh, associated, which will be computed by the endomorphisms of the unit inside of the braided tensor category uh, that you uh, associate to the circle. Um, and this thing will be an E3 algebra for similar reasons. Okay. So this is just like a bunch of stuff that I was able to recover about my field theory just by starting with, um, you know, basically I knew what was uh, attached to this cobordism just like by knowing like what the composition law was on endomorphisms. Like I didn't actually have to do any geometry to find this. Similarly, like you can see the braiding structure uh, from the fact that this thing will actually have two, um, two compatible multiplications. Um, and this one will actually have three compatible multiplications, uh, which gives rise to the E3 structure. Um, all right, and so for the rest of this uh, talk, or sorry, like in the rest of this conference, uh, we've sort of learned uh, like what these things are. So uh, Tudor uh, explained that these things were related to BOAs. In his talk, uh, this thing we've seen is like related to the BFN construction. And so uh, the goal, uh, the thing I'd like to understand is can we construct, I'm sorry. So if we have a 3D N equals four field theory, uh, given by a group, acting on a uh, representation, can we construct categories ZA, sorry, two categories, ZA of a point and ZB of a point, uh, 
that let us reconstruct all the invariants we have seen during the rest of the week. Um, okay, and so let me say like a little bit uh, more about this. Um, so at least for this B model, uh, so the answer is yes. So this was basically constructed by uh, Kapustin, Rosansky, and Solana, and then later work of Kapustin and Rosansky, I think like back in like what, 2010? Uh, huh? Maybe, maybe even earlier than that. Um, so this one has been known for like a really, really long time. Uh, but this guy is uh, still a mystery. Um, okay, so when G is abelian, Um, I'll say that there is an algebraic construction, uh, which is work in progress. Of myself, uh, Ben Gamage, and Aaron Maselji. Uh, Aaron was, well, was only on the paper that's appeared. Uh, the paper that's about to appear is just myself and Gamage. Um, but it's a purely, it's like a, it's like a, just a complicated algebra, uh, algebra construction. And I don't really think that that's the right thing to talk about today. Um, the key like input, which we use, um, is that this thing is supposed to categorify something in representation theory uh, called uh, category O. So the fact that this is true is basically in a paper due to Matt Bullimore, uh, Tudor Damafte, Davide Gallodo, and myself. Um, but I don't really wanna have to explain like what category O is and I think it would take us like really far afield. So I'm gonna try and answer a different question. Um, and, and that is, what is the analytic construction of this category supposed to look like? So unfortunately, I don't have any results uh, on this. Uh, Tudor, uh, Nick, and I basically examined uh, the braided tensor category associated to a circle uh, in an analytic manner. Uh, but we got stuck very quickly uh, due to a certain problem, which I'll explain in a minute. But I think that this problem can definitely be resolved, but I think resolving it is gonna take a lot of time. And it's gonna take a lot of people to do a lot of analysis. And the people who are gonna do this analysis are the people in this room. So I wanna tell you like, what is like the analysis construction of this category? And if you want to read a little bit more about it, uh, there's some good papers now that have appeared. In fact, I wouldn't even have uh, attempted to revisit this construction if it wasn't uh, due to some of these papers. So there's a paper now that has appeared to to Doan and Reshikov uh, when they in their first draft of the paper, their first sort of talking about it, they didn't even know that they were solving a problem in 3D mirror symmetry. Uh, Second is gonna be a paper, there's a paper, or well, I say there's work uh, that's coming of Asan Khan where he's given some talks, which you can read about it a little bit. And then there's uh, also a paper of, uh, of Wang uh, called like monopoles in the Seidel spectral sequence, uh, where he also does a little bit of the algebra, uh, that's, or a little bit of the analysis that's required to do these things. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about like the kind of things 
I should say that this construction that they like find, it's like reasonably obvious from the physical perspective. The question is just like, can you do anything with it? Um, and, and they can. All right, so let me, before doing that, let me like try and explain uh, just a little bit of background. So how am I doing on time? Wasted about 20 minutes. Uh, and so the background that I want to talk about uh, is on first on complex Morse theory. Okay, so let me assume that I'm in the following situation. Suppose that X is a, a Kähler manifold. Uh, let me assume actually also that it's gonna be exact. Uh, it won't, it'll come up later. And then also let me assume that I have a holomorphic function. Um, okay, so there's uh, like a, a fact, which is that uh, the gradient flow for the real part of W uh, is equivalent to the Hamiltonian flow for the imaginary part of W. I'm gonna call this one H, I'm gonna call this one, or actually I guess I don't need to give them a separate name. Okay, so proof, it's extremely easy. So by compatibility of the symplectic form and the Riemannian metric, um, you can see that uh, the Hamiltonian vector field. Oh, I guess maybe I do want to call some H just so I don't write so much. Pull this thing up. You can see that the uh, Hamiltonian vector field uh, for H is equal to I times uh, the gradient of F, which is the real part of W. But just by the Cauchy-Riemann equation, uh, this is the same thing as the gradient. Maybe I made a mistake with my sign, but it's either plus or minus the, uh, the gradient of the imaginary part. Okay, so this like basically tells you uh, that, that these two uh, things are the same. Um, maybe like one other fact Uh, oh, sorry, that was supposed to be, uh, sorry, you're right. That was supposed to be the, um, sorry, what did I even write? Uh, what? No, I want the gradient of the real part to be I times the gradient in the real part to be the imaginary part. Okay, basically you guys can figure it out. The other, the other bet that you need to worry about is just, yeah, this is true. Or sorry, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, you're right. It's the Hamiltonian vector field, sorry, the imaginary part. All right, sorry. Th this is uh, really easy. I'm sorry that I uh, much it. Okay, another fact that's gonna be useful is that the critical points of W are gonna be equal to the critical points of, uh, the rotate, rotation of W by any zeta, where zeta is just some phase. Uh, 
Um, I'll need this in a second. Okay. But a consequence of this uh, fact is that um, gradient flow preserves the imaginary part of W. Um, so that means that generically, there are no gradient trajectories between critical points. I mean, also they all have the same index, but basically the reason is because like if you had a gradient flow and then now you project down to W, uh, basically in the W plane, you just have this picture where like you have your critical points and any gradient flow is just going straight in this direction, preserving the imaginary part. Um, and so that means that unless your critical points are like actually all on a horizontal or on a horizontal line, there like won't be any gradient flows between them. Okay, but uh, this thing uh, saves the day. Like, so all the critical points of all of the different rotations like of this function are all the same, but like you can connect uh, two critical points. Uh, let's call them Xi and Xj with critical values wi and wj, or maybe not that you can, but it's possible to, or maybe possible to, um, a gradient flow of uh, a rotated w, form of w, where this is wj minus wy, uh, over the norm. Okay. So we call these guys uh, zeta instantons, or sorry, zeta solitons. Okay. So there's something else interesting that you can do with this. So um, consider the manifold uh, curly X IJ, which is the space of maps from R into X uh, that basically uh, asymptote or like they have limits uh, either going to minus infinity or infinity at x critical points xi and xj. So, does that make sense? This thing, there's like a natural uh, Morse function, which I'll call uh, the zeta action, which is equal to uh, the integral over the real line, sorry, its value on a particular map is the integral over uh, the real line of uh, a primitive, the pullback of, the, of a primitive for the one form uh, plus uh, the, the Hamiltonian given by the imaginary part of zeta inverse. Of w. So this is just the ordinary symplectic action. Um, but this thing is telling you that um, uh, they're just critical points, critical points of w. Yeah, I, I just putting boundary, uh, you know, infinite boundary conditions at a vacuum. Um, okay, so you can look at this, uh, and then uh, you can, uh, you know, look at the 
uh, you know, the Morse complex. Um, or uh, you can look at Flores equation. Uh, and in this case, uh, you find uh, uh, just the, the Witten equation. And I'm not really confident about my uh, plus or minus sign here. Not that big of a deal. Um, so if you just look at the floor equation with this particular Hamiltonian, uh, like you get the, this like recovers like the Witten equation. And so like if you were to study the Morse complex, uh, like for this guy, uh, the differential would be given by counting uh, solutions to this. Uh, right here, I'd use the fact that this thing basically coincides uh, with the uh, gradient of the real part in a certain sense. The Witten equation. Floor's equation. Floor, Andreas Floor, like floor theory. Uh, okay, and then so then there's an idea uh, which I think has appeared uh, once in math and once in physics. So in the physics, it's due to Hadish. Sorry, in math, it's due to Hadesh, and then in physics, it's due to Gaiodo, uh, more in Witten, which is that you can construct the uh, Fakayasidal category U is an element of this space, the path. Lambda is a primitive for the one form. So, or sorry for that, sorry for the symplectic form, sorry. Yes, anyway, thank you. I have a tendency to garble my speech. So if any of you notice me saying something ridiculous, just tell me, um, I really appreciate it. It's just this plus uh, like J times the, um, uh, Hamiltonian vector field associated with this function. Uh, using Witten's equation. Yeah. Yes. I mean, because Floor is the most famous person to study it in math in the 80s. I don't know. Like, you know, I mean, like, okay, anyway, I don't know. That's what it's called. Uh, okay, so anyway, so using this uh, Witten equation. And so the idea is uh, that, like, uh, the, you're going to construct a category whose objects are going to be uh, twist, it's going to be an A infinity category. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this construction because it's very involved, but the rough idea is that it's, that the objects are gonna be twisted complexes uh, of critical points of W. So the, the, the indecomposable objects of the category you should think are just critical points, like the simplest objects. And then uh, the morphisms are, are basically given, uh, by uh, counting these uh, zeta solitons. Between critical points, sorry, and actually I should have said this thing's also in physics is called zeta instanton equation. Uh, and then uh, the A infinity structure uh, is going to be given by a recipe, which I'll write over there in the space. Um, it's very different than the way that the A infinity structure is constructed normally. Uh, but let me just say while I'm erasing, 
The good thing about this particular model and the thing, reason why I need it is because this model could possibly work in infinite dimensions. Like if you had an infinite dimensional Kähler manifold uh, it, you, with uh, where the critical points are all finite dimensional, or so you have isolated uh, critical points, then these like gradient flow, or sorry, these zeta uh, soliton moduli spaces are often finite dimensional. So you have like some possibility of like actually doing this in infinite dimensions, and that's what I'm gonna need to do in a second. Um, okay, so the, the idea is that the infinity structure comes from the following counting problem. And if you wanna read more about it, there's a 500 page paper uh, that you can read about it. <laughs> uh, where you're gonna look at maps from the plane into X Um, satisfying the Witten equation. Uh, but they're going to be uh, covering uh, gradient flow, or uh, I guess people call these things uh, gradient flow polygons. Uh, in, in this copy of C. So the plane that I'm talking about is this copy. And so what I mean by a gradient flow polygon is uh, suppose that I'm looking at like the uh, target of my super potential, you'll have some interesting number of uh, critical points. And you can make a polygon, well, sorry, and then we know that the zeta instantons uh, all move with, uh, in straight lines with slope zeta. So you can take like some polygon uh, and label each of these things by label uh, the vertices or critical points. These things you label by, um, sorry, I'm just getting a different color, by zeta solitons, where zeta is the slope between these two critical points. And then, uh, you can ask for your map zero to sort of map into the, like the composition of your map U with W to map into this, uh, map into this polygon. And so in terms of this plane, th these are like asymptotic conditions about like what the Witten equation does, like as you go off to infinity in certain directions. Um, and basically there's some like really interesting algebra that you can build by studying all of these possible polygons and like the way that they're related to each other. And this is called the algebra of the infinite. Okay. So I feel like I, the algebra of the infrared. So I feel like I've got about 10 minutes. So I'm moving pretty slow. So don't ask a question. What? My handwriting might be worse. <laughs> okay, uh, and so there's a similar version of this, which is what I'm actually gonna need, uh, where uh, you use the gauged Witten equation. I was gonna write it down, but I'm like clearly not gonna have time. Uh, and in this case, you'd construct like the G equivariant for pyocytal category. Okay, so now, uh, so if you look in the appendix, now we're gonna like apply this. Um, although any physicist or well, competent physicist could have computed what's in this appendix. So uh, it's a place you can find it, but like I, I wouldn't claim uh, that uh, it's like so, so original. But if you look in the appendix to uh, like my paper with Bolmor, Dmate, Gaiotto, uh, what you find is that um, 3D N equals 
form uh, can be rewritten as uh, a 2D n equals 2 comma 2 GLSM uh, to a path space. Or I should, I should say on an interval. Um, and this is the kind of thing. Uh, well, okay. And, and we've sort of learned that these 3D n equals 4 theories that you can either take like their A twist to get like an A model, or you can take their B twist to get uh, this 3D B model, which we haven't talked about very much. And that's compatible with the 2D. Interesting. So these are things that people have seen before. But unfortunately, these things are like infinite dimensional. Um, all right, so let me, uh, I'll say, tell you exactly what these things are, but there's gonna be some path group, some path space, and then there's gonna be some super potential. Uh, and also this action will end up being Hamiltonian. I'll tell you what these things are in just a second. And if you do this A twist, the thing that you're gonna find is gonna be some kind of a Fakayasidal category of this path space with this path group and this interesting super potential. And in this twist, you're gonna end up finding some category of matrix factorizations on the same path space with your super potential and some sort of a group. And if you like analyze this, this basically gives you this KRS construction. And if you analyze this, uh, this thing is now going by the name of the, of the morphism space in the footer two category. But since I'm gauged, I'm gonna call it the cyber two category, which is gonna be our 3DA model. So this is the morphisms. Okay, so let me like explain uh, just a tiny uh, bit about what this is gonna be. And I think because I'm running extremely behind, uh, I'm just gonna explain what happens when you don't have a gauge group. And this is the thing that you can read about in uh, the paper of Doan and Reshikov. Uh, okay, so we'll assume that I just have uh, a hyper Taylor manifold. So this is not the Kähler manifold that I had before. So let's call it Y. Let me go ahead and choose a complex structure. Uh, so you have your holomorphic symplectic form, which is like the J plus I times the omega K. Let me go ahead and assume that this thing is exact. All right. Um, furthermore, uh, let me assume that uh, L0 and L1 are exact holomorphic, uh, exact I holomorphic Lagrangians. Then uh, you can look at the path space. Um, actually, this is going to be my X, like my X from before. It's going to be, um, this is going to be my Kähler manifold. It's going to be the path space from the interval uh, that uh, sends uh, the, the endpoints to uh, L0 and L1. And you, there's an upgrade of the symplectic action functional. Uh, where you can just take the integral over the interval zero one of, uh, so if I apply it to a map, I can pull back this holomorphic symplectic form now, and then I can add on uh, the, uh, oh wait, do I need to add my thing? 
Oh yeah, and then possibly I might need to add on some uh, boundary terms. So if these things uh, have potentials like F0 and F1, there might be like some uh, boundary uh, terms of this action needed to make it um, the variation vanish. But whatever. Okay. So then one can try and study the Pachyocidal category of this X, uh, or maybe I'll call this thing W of X and W using this algebra, the infrared method, the interval. And uh, this thing will have objects. One like can actually just compute like the critical points of this function. It's the same as like in the ordinary setting. So the, so the objects, are going to be twisted complexes of uh, intersection points. Uh, inside, uh, sorry, of intersection points of P inside of L0 intersect L1. The more the, if you look at like what is a zeta soliton. Uh, you find that this thing is a uh, pseudo holomorphic strip, a J zeta pseudo holomorphic strip. I guess in this case, it'd really be a holomorphic strip. Uh, like with, you know, boundary conditions given by these Lagrangians and these, and these points. Um, so what's J zeta? J zeta is gonna be, um, uh, let me assume, that zeta is going to be cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. So this is just some complex number. Uh, this thing is going to be the symplectic form given by cosine of theta omega j plus sine of theta omega k. Um, so this thing sees all of the complex structures perpendicular to i, depending on what your zeta is. J and K. Sorry? Uh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, J and K, yeah, sorry. The complex structure, not the Kähler form. I had written down the Kähler form before. Um, yeah, that's right. And then these like zeta instantons, uh, these things are going to be maps uh, that satisfy uh, the equation like I D U D X. So if you, so a zeta instanton is going to be a map from a two manifold into a path space. So that's really a map from a three manifold. And so these things are going to be maps from three manifolds that satisfy this footer equation. Z. Zero, so this thing's called the Fudor equation. Okay, anyway, and so you can read about this in this uh, paper of Doan and Reshikov. The thing that I want to, um, how much time do I have? I just hit my time, is that right? Okay, um, so the thing that I want to emphasize is that uh, for the applications that I have in mind, uh, you actually want to study the gauged version of this problem. So, uh, so there's a gauged version of this problem. For now, you're going to have some hyper Hamiltonian action. On your hyper Kähler on your hyper Kähler manifold. Uh, going to have some moment map. To uh, answered imaginary quaternions. Uh, and basically, if you choose a complex structure, this thing will give you a complex moment map in any complex structure. 
Um, okay, and so now you can consider like the following space. It's basically almost exactly the same. Uh, so I'm going to ignore the boundary conditions for now just because it's uh, going to make things too crazy. But anyway, you can look at like maps from uh, the interval into y uh, plus uh, complexified connections on the trivial bundle on the plane uh, for the complex complexified group. Uh, and then there's going to be some boundary conditions, uh, which you can see in, uh, in my paper. There's an action now of the space of this path group. Uh, there are going to be two functions in the game. So there's going to be a uh, super potential, which is going to take a uh, map and a connection. Uh, and it's going to take you to the interval, or sorry, the integral over the interval of u star, again, of this Louisville one form. Uh, but now you're going to add on an extra term where you're going to pair the complex moment map in complex structure i that we chose before. So I'm going to choose this complex structure just like before. Uh, and then you're going to pair this with A, DT. Uh, and then finally, um, I guess that's all I need here, plus some boundary terms. Uh, so anyway, this is just like a complexified version of the in invariant symplectic action that shows up in the theory of vortices, like already. Uh, and then on the other side, uh, there's going to be a real moment map for this action. Uh, and that roughly takes the form, uh, you take the real moment map for your, uh, oh, I shouldn't call it that. Uh, I should call it, I'll call it uh, phi. So this is the real moment map for the uh, action of this path group. And it's given by the formula that phi of u and uh, a dt is equal to the real moment map for y composed with u plus uh, dta minus dta bar is the commutator of a and a bar. So this is just the curvature of my complexified connection. Um, okay, so then this thing defines like an infinite dimensional GLSM. And one can try and study it using the gauged Witten equation. So the thing that one's gonna find is just like an exactly kind of like a version of this story, where now uh, like the objects are not actually gonna be intersection points. But if suppose you had G invariant Lagrangians as your boundary condition, they're not gonna be intersection points, they're gonna be uh, uh, G orbits like that uh, in the intersection, right? Like uh, they're gonna be like flows for the, for the this thing is going to give you a flow for uh, the uh, for the real moment map, which is just the same as the group action. So, like this thing will do some Hamiltonian flow for this Hamiltonian, which is just the uh, group action. So, anyway, so these things will this uh, these things will be G orbits um, inside of, or sorry, maybe not orbits. I should say paths. Uh, G flow paths inside of this intersection point. And then the soliton equations are actually going to give you uh, vor vortices in different complex structures that like lie on these uh, Lagrangians with suitable boundary conditions. And then uh, this Fudor equation is going to be uh, replaced by the general Seiberg Witten equation. Um, and so uh, it's an interesting analytic problem to like actually build this thing. I think that this paper that I said that I mentioned of, uh, of uh, uh, Wong, uh, I think like makes like some seri serious progress in this uh, direction, but I haven't had a chance to read it very carefully. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is what the A model is supposed to be. It's supposed to have objects, these holomorphic Lagrange, you know, G invariant holomorphic Lagrangians, or maybe generalizations of that, the, you know, morph the 
morphisms between Lagrangians are supposed to be, um, after you mod out by gauge, will just be intersections, intersection points in the quotient. And then you're supposed to count vortices uh, with uh, appropriate boundary condition. And that thing will let you build some, two ca some category. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, this uh, Seidel's spectral sequence and monopole formula or something. I think it's the name of the paper. Um, oh, okay. Um, I guess I saw a talk he gave, which was a, uh, had a different title. Um, but anyway, it's a very interesting paper. Let me maybe say the reason why Tudor and I gave up on this, uh, or, or and Nick and I had given up on this. Well, we, we tried this uh, in like, what, 2017 with the line operators and we gave up. Okay, we did other things. We started using vertex algebras instead. Uh, and we started, and I started using D modules instead. Um, so what, what is the issue that like caused us to stop? Despite like what you might think, it wasn't the fact that all the analysis was infinite dimensional because we're physicists and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was a different problem. So the, so the problem, was that our target spaces are always non-compact. And this implies, so in like the theory of like the ordinary Fakaya category, this implies that you need something called like wrapping. Um, so you need a holomorphic version of basically like wrapping is like the most important thing. Also these things go by the name of like Louisville sectors. Uh, Lagrangian skeleta. Uh, and let me just show you the simplest uh, example where like this sort of thing comes up. So the simplest example that you could possibly study is when your hyperkähler manifold is T star C star. The symplectic form in this case is going to be um, dp wedge uh, d log q, where q is the coordinate on your, uh, on your C star. Okay, so let me not try and study the problem where I have Lagrangian boundary conditions. Let me study an easier problem where I'm just gonna work on a, on a circle instead of on an interval. You can try and study the Vakaya Seidel category of T star C star, or sorry, of the loop space of T star C star together with our symplectic action, which if you remember uh, is gonna be, uh, so now let me just think of P and Q as being uh, functions uh, of, uh, of my circle coordinate. So I have my P and Q. Uh, this thing is going to be the integral zero to one. Oh, sorry. And I'm going to choose my lambda to be P D log Q. Uh, and so I'm not writing my pullbacks anymore. I'm just thinking of these things as functions of T. So I have P log Q is now like some function D log Q, some function of T or some uh, one form on the interval. And then like one can like try and ask like, what are the critical points of this thing? Well, like the critical points are gonna be the, uh, the constant loops. Well, so one, like they're already not isolated. So that seems kind of, that already causes some problems with this algebra of the infrared, really only works well with Morse functions at the moment. Although to make it work in general, you're gonna actually need uh, an extension that will work in the more spot case. Uh, but so this critical points are just the constant loops. Uh, 
this inside of this loop space. Um, and so you might guess, so there's some theorems in the finite dimensional setting about what the Fikayasidal category looks like for a more spot function. So you might guess that in fact, this Fikayasidal category is actually just equal to the Fikaya category of the critical set or of, of the critical locus. Uh, because I've only got like one component of uh, like a critical, I've only got like a single connected component of critical points. And so there's some idea that like this thing might actually possibly be true. Okay, but unfortunately, you find immediately that this guess fails mirror symmetry. Okay, but this actually like isn't shocking. Uh, in this example, like I can completely fix. It's just sort of the general case. Uh, it's the general case that's difficult. So let's think about the analogy in two dimensions. Okay, I mean, I wanna finish this point and then I'll stop. So let's think about the 2G analogy where you're looking at um, T star S1 and you're trying to compute uh, like the symplectic homology and mirror symmetry tells you that that thing ought to be equal to poly vector fields on C star, which of course is given by functions X, X inverse, and then some degree, some odd variable. So these are functions on your C star, your mirror C star and like whatever. Well, you know, that <laughs> this thing, if you tried to say that this thing is the Morse homology, of uh, the loop space uh, with the action functional integral of PDQ, uh, like that's wrong. Everybody knows that you're supposed to add on for exactly the reason that I had before. You'll just get the, 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 critic, the constant locus and you'll just find just these functions in epsilon. Like you won't find the X and the X inverse. So everybody knows that you're supposed to add on this quadratic perturbation, which is supposed to fix the behavior at infinity. And now this thing is the homology of the loop space of S1, which is isomorphic to the poly vector fields. Okay. So anyway, so I had to add on this extra term. Well, it turns out that this works here. If you work out, if you just add on uh, p squared, uh, like onto this thing, you get the right, you get a category that seems to have the right behavior. Uh, but like, uh, yeah, anyway, doing this in general, like seems like extremely difficult. And this is actually like a categorification of the wrapping that goes on when you define symplectic homology in the ordinary Fikaya category. So there's like this whole like kind of extra theory that's kind of not understood. And that's the, the real problem. Anyway, I'll stop. <laughs>